Jack Honeybee Development. That's an interesting publication. And I just want to stop and touch on that for a second, Ian, because th there's been a lot of research interest and a lot of inquiry and just thought process in general around better understanding that annual cycle of the honeybee colony and what are the triggers or what are those mechanistic switches that get engaged in the spring um, when, well, juvenile hormone titers, you know, start, start, start to go up. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on whether or not that's the, the act of foraging itself. You know, it's the flight activity coming back to the hive that's stimulating those, uh, you know, hormonal uh, pathways or ep acting as epigenetic, you know, uh, factors. Um, there's been a lot of question as to whether or not it's around daylight hours, temperature. I wouldn't say that these research publications are pointing conclusively to the fact that it's microbially based, um, but I think that they have a role to play. So we directly know, and these are recent publications. Now we directly know that the resident microbiome of the honeybee, when it's exposed to uh, plant uh, pollen polysaccharides from the intine layer of the pollen shell, hemocellulose uh, in particular, degrades those polysaccharide compounds, produces metabolites that impact physiological pathways responsible for prostaglandins uh, and juvenile hormone uh, derivatives. So there's a, there's a microbial factor here, which is environmentally driven. So I think it's another part of that story. Okay, just a minute. I'm going to take a shot of uh, bourbon, and then I need you to explain that last bit again, because uh, that sounded very interesting. Yeah, how's things on your end? Things are good, yeah. Yeah, very uh, exciting. You know, it, uh, my, my reservations to kind of take uh, our in-house work commercial, they were warranted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> it, uh, it? It is, yeah. No, hey, look, no, no, no complaints. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of early interest, but uh, yeah, but yeah it's, it's, no longer a, it's no longer a passion project. Uh, it's real now. It's real. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm getting some of that mixed into uh, global patties. I haven't got it yet. I think they're just in the process of getting everything together to mix up the batch. But they better hurry up because, uh, or have you shipped the product out to them yet? Yeah, so the it was the delay was actually on my end because oh. I wanted to get our updated uh, you know, kind of reshuffled form formulation uh, in, the, in that mix for you. So ah. they were waiting on me. Yeah, they, they've had it for, you, you'll get it on time. Oh, good. Yeah, because we're going to be, it's our spring is starting to look like spring. Hopefully we get it. We'll see if we get it. But if we get, so at any rate, I just want to provide a little bit of introduction here. How long have we been collaborating together now? It's been um, five years or I've been kind of losing track. It's been quite a while. Eh? That, that sounds about right, Ian. Yeah, five years. Yeah. Yeah, so Andrew reached out to me quite a while ago um, in regards to our keen interest in focusing on honeybee nutrition. I think we both have the same wave wavelength on that and just looking at what's going on within the environment and within agriculture and what the bees need and maybe there's deficit there and how as beekeepers we could fill in that deficit with something like uh, like a a supplement or some kind of a nutritional profile to help um, increase the overall health of the honeybee. So for the last little while, we've been just kind of dabbling here and there. I always joke that you're the brains and I'm the bees and we're just kind of <laughs> finding sure. our way we'll through. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also say that uh, oh. you're either absolutely brilliant or batshit crazy. So we're just on that border. Like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, uh, we've been kind of you're, you're not the only you're not the only person to have ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> we could kind of dabbling with some uh, different uh, recipes and supplements and all this kind of stuff. And and over the last while, I think you've been very effective in putting together this uh, product to help focus on exactly what we've been trying to achieve here. Been using your product for the last uh, two years for sure. And I think I'm seeing an overall response and better health and just helping me get through tight situations. But uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. Uh, just describe the product you have. And I think you have a presentation there you'd like to step through. 
Yeah, yeah, we'll jump over to that, Ian. But I, I think you were kind of touching on some key key messages there. And it's, in my view, like a good nutritional support program. You know, we're very much used to as beekeepers, a lot of hyperbolic, you know, and kind of par- parabolic language around what the expectation or the intended outcome of you know, providing an intervention is. You know, doubling brood production or blow, blowing the lids off of your hives or you know, zero overwinter losses. And, you know, it's, there's been quite a bit of that in the space. And, you know, I, I get a lot of messages on the back end of my website asking me, you know, so what is this stuff supposed to do? Like there's really no description on the, on the website. And part of that's because I built that website myself and don't really have the technical capabilities to build a really good website. But the other piece more seriously is that we've, we've really taken a very conservative approach to, to marketing. Um, you know, I, I don't want to speak in parabolic, you know, terms and hyperbolic language. I just want to be real with people about what I've been working on and make that available if people, you know, wish to try it in their apiaries. And to your point, nutrition, you know, when you feed an animal well, whatever that livestock is, it, it's really about more resilience in that organism. Uh, you're very familiar with cattle, obviously. When a cattle is well nourished, its growth rate doesn't double. Uh, you know, those cattle are just less likely to express disease states. They become more resilient when their nutritional requirements are, be, are being met adequately, right? And that's what I was uh, attempting uh, with this work. And that's where I think we've gotten this to a place where we're rounding out that, mimicking that nutritional profile of pollen and nectar uh, close enough that I'm seeing more resilience. And that's that was kind of the end game. And uh, it seems, seems to be... Uh, other people are starting to give me their feedback other than you, Ian, and it, it seems to be fairly consistent that uh, I think we have something meaningful here. Perfect. So with that, I'm going to try, I'm well, not a, a Zoom guy here, but I'm going to try to jump over and share my screen if I can. Very good. Uh, an investigation into the nutritional composition of floral pollen and floral nectar. Historical investigative methodologies in the nutritional requirements of the honeybee and how a change in methodology changes the output of the investigation. That's really kind of one of the core messages here that I want to deliver to people is why do I, why do I think that what I've been up to over the last decade has produced anything more meaningful than what's already been done? And it really isn't um, anything. I guess the uniqueness of it is, is the methodology itself. And that's the, what I'm going to submit to anybody else trying to do what I'm trying to do. Uh, or any researchers or any feed formulators, uh, I'm going to recommend a methodology. And an overview of bioactivator for pollen and biocontrol as a nectar profile mimic. The study of honeybee nutrition dates back to the 19th and early 20th century when researchers first began to investigate the dietary needs of the honeybee. Nearly all of these investigative efforts have been focused on the observation and or the measurement, measurement of effects when, when varying elements and concentration concentrations thereof are provided to the honeybee in isolation within a laboratory context. And that's really what we've been up to uh, since we started this endeavor is taking honeybees again into a research or laboratory context and feeding them different components of what we thought were elements of pollen in varying concentrations looking for an effect. Uh, and, and that work, by and large, uh, there was a landmark work uh, that was produced uh, by De Groot. And that work really has lasted for, for multiple decades now as the backbone of artificial feed formulations for honeybees. Uh, and he studied the proportional relationship or the minimum proportional relationship requirements of 10 essential amino acids. The question that I had was, do these historical observations accurately reflect the nutritional or amino acid composition of floral pollen? And then by extension, define the nutritional requirements of, of the honeybee. There's a bit going on on this slide, uh, but one of the key messages here uh, that I want to deliver is the importance of reference data. When we really didn't have that reference data available, or at least not at my fingertips. Um, what I wanted to know are what are the things that are in floral pollen and what are the things that are in floral nectar and what are their concentrations that provide I mean, we've all observed this as beekeepers. When a flow goes on, you really can't replace the, that, that effect that happens. Uh, you know, that, that late spring condition in your apiary where, you know, everything is well. Uh, the population is doing what you want it to do. I mean, there's, you know, there's some other factors going on there. Uh, 
but it's one of your least problematic time periods of the year as a beekeeper uh, when those nutritional those nutritional cues and those nutritional requirements are all being met. And we really, or at least I couldn't reproduce that same sense or that same state in my apiary using what was currently available as supplemental feeds. Uh, and that's really what made me started to ask this question. Okay, what is it about floral pollen and what is it about floral nectar um, that we're currently not able to, to reproduce? And I felt like the only way to, to answer that question was to start to understand what's in nectar and what's in pollen. Um, when I started to look for that information, it was pretty pretty apparent that there was no database that you could go and just pull uh, pull from uh, to get all of that information. And that's really what I've been up to over the last decade is building that reference uh, database. Like the reason we know what high blood pressure is in a human is because we have a solid reference database of you know what 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 a healthy human's blood pressure should be. Um, you know whatever it is that you're trying to measure, you really do need you know a good set of reference data to determine whether or not your intervention is effective or your analytical technique is working. You know, it's reference data is highly leveraged in any scientific endeavor, medical endeavor, nutritional endeavor. And I really, we really didn't have that uh, reference database. So really for the better part of the last decade, that's what I've been up to is building a reference database of the nutritive profile of uh, nectar uh, and pollen. One of the first things that jumped out at me when I started to compile uh, that data was the amino acid uh, profile. So I have uh, Degroot's 10 uh, that he initially studied uh, over here under the yellow bar where I have mTOR activation thresholds uh, being referenced. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I want to draw special attention to uh, is the other side of the amino acid profile of, of floral nectar and floral pollen that really nobody's been paying any attention to. Uh, because it wasn't a part of that landmark study of Degroot, it's really kind of gone on rec unrecognized. There's one amino acid uh, in particular. Uh, so I guess maybe, maybe I'll walk that back just a little bit. The bulk of the free amino acid content of floral pollen and floral nectar exist in this profile between alanine and tyrosine. So all of the primary study and all of the primary focus on this amino acid profile uh, over here uh, has left this blank spot in artificial feed formulations that actually represent the majority. Uh, and I couldn't say by orders of magnitude, uh, but certainly the greater majority of the amino acids in nectar and pollen are represented over here between alanine and tyrosine. One amino acid in particular, proline, if I was to represent this graphically on this chart, this chart would need to double in scale in order to represent the proportional relationship of protein, uh, proline to the rest, the rest of the amino acids. It's, it's dominant and, and, and meaningfully so. If you dig into the research, I, you know, I reference a few publications here and a few slides on, on proline, but it is very biologically significant to the honeybee for immunocompetence uh, and, a, and a whole host of, of key physiological pathways. But that's kind of the key message there. I just kind of wanted to hit home about the importance of having reference data, the fact that that reference data didn't exist. And that's really what I've been up to over the last uh, nine, nine plus years is kind of building that reference database set. And then we started to leverage it as we were building it. And we're still adding things to that, uh, that reference uh, database. And we're still coming up with uh, new, new and interesting ways to leverage that information. But that's kind of the primary message here is that we've, We've really been missing the mark in artificial honeybee feeds because we didn't have a good reference database. Immunocompetence and how that translates into apiary performance. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this slide verbatim, obviously, but here are some of the uh, immunological challenges that uh, that an apiary face today. Uh, it, it can be pretty overwhelming, especially in the context of um, apiaries that exist in an agricultural uh, setting where they're dependent on artificial feed formulations a lot through the, through the year. Um, and there's a general lack of diversity uh, in what's available uh, from, the, from that environment. Uh, it, it can be problematic. So, so mono, monocrop uh, sources uh, of pollen kind of limit the, the diversity of nutrients that you're going to get. And when you're leveraging artificial feeds uh, to supplement uh, that, that nutritional deficiency, uh, in the environment and those artificial feeds aren't formulated 
to address key key amino acids or the most dominant amino acids in nectar and pollen that are directly responsible for immunocompetence of the honeybee, it, it's a problematic situation. I just wanted to highlight that there, you know, I, I took some time to speak about proline. It is the most dominant amino acid in nectars and pollens, uh, and it is primarily responsible for the entire hu humoral immune response of the honeybee. Just, just maybe a point of distinction there on the humoral immunity in a honeybee. It's in mammals like humans, we've, over the last few years, we've heard a lot about the immune response and the production of you know, antibodies uh, as, as a part of our humoral immune response. Well, in honeybees, uh, they don't produce antibodies. They, they produce AMPs or, or antimicrobial peptides. And those antimicrobial peptides, are their, their function, uh, how well they perform uh, in being produced in adequate concentrations are ex completely dependent on adequate proline and adequate cysteine. Uh, and those amino acids, again, are not currently being addressed by artificial feed formulations. So we'll dig back into proline here. I think this is very important. Proline is the most dominant amino acid in floral nectar and floral pollen, worker and royal jelly, and the body tissue of the honeybee, with drones having the highest body concentration, followed by queens and worker bees, respectively. Second only to carbohydrate, proline is the most sought after and utilized nutrient by the honeybee. What does the body of published entomology research say about the biological significance of proline to the honeybee? Among the amino acids found in floral nectar and floral pollen, proline is unique because honeybees have the ability to taste this unique amino acid. It not only contributes to a taste preferred by the honeybee, honeybees, but it stimulates their salt cell, which is a chemosensory receptor, resulting in increased feeding behavior or a phagia stimulant. Like if you see people, there's a few videos kind of kicking around of folks uh, doing side-by-side -side comparisons of biocontrol being in some syrup uh, versus you know, just straight sucrose syrup, the bees will always uh, preferentially uh, take, take feed that has uh, pro proline in it. Proline increases honeybee cold hardiness by, by being utilized as an antifreeze protein that lowers their super cooling point. That research, uh, if you just put those search terms into uh, PubMed or one of the other uh, repositories, uh, it's, it's a really uh, cool, cool uh, research study that they did there. The hemolymph for the blood of the honeybee contains proline at approximately 50% concentration of the total amino acid composition. This amino acid plays a vital role in the honeybee immune defense mechanisms, both humoral, uh, the production of antimicrobial peptides, but as well as cell-mediated immunity. Proline is also oxidized as a metabolic fuel by the honeybee, acting as a secondary energy source, assisting with the in-hive metabolic demand uh, during uh, for, for thermal, thermal regulation and early stage flight. So that initial you know, burst of flight uh, when they first launch, uh, it's, there's some research that indicates that this is uh, the oxidation of proline, uh, and then it's uh, carbohydrate that sustains that, uh, that flight. During our investigations into the nutritional composition of floral nectar and floral pollen, the dominant presence of proline was well established in the botany literature and its biological significance to the honeybee has been thoroughly investigated and published in the world of entomology. We felt it was time to make this information known to the beekeeping community, not only make it known to the beekeeping community, but to make it available uh, in the context of a nutritional support program. In summary, the full amino acid profile of floral pollen and ideal quantities of each only become apparent when you're analyzing a sound reference database. As that reference database did not exist, we built one based on over 100 years of botany research publications. That work has enabled us to provide biologically appropriate concentrations of big roots 10, helping to ensure that key amino acids are provided in a quantity that ensures that nature, sorry, has defined as a threshold for adequate activation of the mechanistic target of rapamycin pathway. That's known, that's a broadly preserved nutrient sensing pathway that's known to integrate uh, nutritional conditions with cell growth and survival in eukaryotes. And that, that includes arthropods. That's probably not a well-known uh, term uh, for, for beekeepers, but I'd like to pull that into the vernacular uh, and make it something that's a little bit more broadly talked about. Because again, when you start to look at the, the composition 
how we're formulating our feeds again is based on day groups minimums. And when you take day groups minimums and the concentrations that are used, like when we first started this work, we were formulating artificial feeds from scratch. So all of the base materials that are used to formulate artificial feeds, I have the reference data on those as well, like the amino acid compositions. So it's very easy to plug and play uh, with those with, with those numbers. And what, what, what we end up seeing is when you look at how these amino acids are represented in pollen, what their distribution is, and you compare that to what we're formulating artificial feeds with, uh, it's very clear that there's deficiencies. And I'm not going to call them out by name. I'll, I'll, I'll make folks work for it a little bit, but there's key amino acids within this profile that are known to drive the mechanistic target of rapamycin pathway, which if that... I'd really encourage uh, beekeepers and, and anybody interested in, in nutrition to think about think about food and, and nutrients as epigenetic factors. They, if, if key nutrients are not present or they're not present in adequate concentrations, you don't get activation of key metabolic pathways. And mechanistic target of rapamycin uh, pathway uh, is one of them. This is an interesting compound. Um, gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. So this neurotransmitter present within both floral pollen and floral nectar is known to provide critical support to the honeybee in both reversal learning tasks, as well as primary motor functions. In honeybees, GABA plays a role in the regulation of various physiological processes, including learning, memory, and social behavior. It has been shown to affect the response of honeybees to certain stimuli, such as odors and taste, and to modulate their sensitivity to sucrose, which is obviously an important source of energy uh, for the honeybee. Research has also suggested that GABA is involved in the regulation of honeybee aggression and the coordination of social behavior in the hive. For example, when honeybee colonies are threatened, obviously they get aggressive. Uh, GABA levels have been found to be found to increase in the honeybee brains in response to these threats, suggesting that it plays a role in the regulation of aggressive behavior. Furthermore, GABA has been shown to be involved in the regulation of sleep uh, in honeybees. Honeybees have been observed to sleep for short uh, bouts throughout the day, and GABA has been found to play a key role in the initiation and maintenance of sleep uh, for honeybees. In summary, gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, is a neurotransmitter that plays a role in the regulation of various physiological processes in the honeybee, including learning, memory, social behavior, aggression, and sleep. GABA is present within both floral nectar and floral pollen, and for the first time uh, through bioactivator and biocontrol, we are making this critical neurotransmitter available at biologically appropriate concentrations as a part of a nutritional support program. Proprietary bioactive profile. There's a I'm not going to dig into this in a whole lot of detail because there's a lot of intellectual property here. I'm all, I, this is a, a challenging presentation for me to put together because it's necessary that I give a certain amount of intellectual property away. Uh, you know, I want beekeepers, anybody that's going to put, uh, you know, a few bucks down to give this stuff a try. I, I want them to know what's gone into it. Um, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because, um, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, supplemental feeds, you know, popping up with proline, you know, so there's that whole thing that I'm trying to balance here. Um, there's a lot of magic in this bioactive profile and a lot of uh, in-house R&D has gone into this. So I'm going to be fairly tight-lipped about most of this, but I am calling special attention to one, uh, one component of this, uh, hemocellulose. And, and I'll dig into why I think that's important and why these uh, pollen uh, polysaccharides are important in, in a few slides. Maybe I'll hold you off there and I'll reboot the Zoom because I don't have a Zoom account. <laughs> so I'll give you a link in about two minutes and then uh, I'll get you to log back on. There we go. I just made you co-host. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, all good. All good. I had a sip of wine during the break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too cheap to buy a subscription. <laughs> Yeah, that's the same with me. I, I don't have a subscription to any of that stuff either. Yeah, I don't use it enough for that. But uh, so the interruption's annoying, but we'll just deal with it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Let's uh, see if I can get this set up a little quicker this time. Ian, I think I burned through 30 minutes of our, <laughs> of our time trying to get the screen share to work. That's interesting. The GABA heads has uh, links to bees sleep. I've never heard that one before. Yeah, yeah, I can send you. Uh, I can send you the link to that uh, 
There's actually a, a couple of research publications that I have in the vault. I can send you on that one. I don't want my bees to sleep though. I want them to work. No, I guess you need a good sleep to have a good day's work, right? <laughs> that's that's That was going to be my next comment. <laughs> Neat that you know you mentioned that proline has something to do with cold hardiness because I had noticed uh, feeding. Well, I call it rocket fuel. I don't know if you mind me calling it rocket fuel or not, but it certainly you know, acts like rocket fuel because you know that you know, it was cold. Like especially last spring, I'm feeding him this syrup and they're breaking cluster. I'm not sure if they're breaking cluster, but they're they're actively moving up and taking the syrup down through cold weather. And that's you know you, typically you think of feeding syrup. And they don't do it in cold weather, but they're they're almost attracted to the stuff and just after it. And so it, it just kind of jogs my memory when you talk about that, that uh, that might be part of the, the, the whole situation there. Yeah, when they measured the uh, super cooling point at the bee, you know, basically that's the point where there's no motor function, you know, left left in the bee, right? Um, when they measured that, it's actually by several, I forget the, I forget the exact number now, but it, it wasn't just by like, you know, a fraction of a degree Celsius, it actually, you know, made them more robust to, I think it was like three point something degrees Celsius difference in the super cooling point that they measured. Boy. Yeah, it was fairly impressive. So essentially what I have up here on screen is an example of multiple studies. Uh, you can do a quick, a quick Google search, uh, you know, go into one of the, uh, you know, PubMed or any, any of the repositories for, uh, for published, published literature. And you can validate this for yourself. Essentially, what the phenomenon is, is that over time, uh, the trace element concentrations of our soil is being depleted. Um, we, in an agricultural context, we need to replace certain minerals to allow those plants to grow. Uh, but certainly, it would not be economically viable to replace uh, the full complement of trace elements that was, uh, I guess, there's two, two kind of measures. This uh, seawater uh, is a good measure of that. Uh, but also we've got a good indicator of what uh, historical or pre-industrial pre levels of trace elements were in plants through uh, sources like humic shale. Uh, so there is some good baseline data of what pre-human agricultural activity trace element concentrations were in the soil uh, and in plants. And I've kind of used that uh, humic shale uh, and, and seawater uh, baseline data to, to kind of get, the, uh, get, get those ballpark uh, concentrations. Essentially, what this study was showing is that in order to provide what they were looking at is a period of time between 1940 and 1991. And they looked at multiple food sources, uh, 17 varieties of fruit, uh, 10 cuts of meat, and some milk and cheese products. The results demonstrated uh, that there has been a significant loss of minerals and trace elements in these foods over that period of time. It is suggested that these result, the results of this study cannot be taken in isolation from recent dietary, environmental, and disease trends. Um, so humans... If you're interested in, in optimizing your own health, humans need 60 minerals um, for, for optimal health. And, you know, there's a double Nobel uh, laureate who was famously quoted as saying that all human disease can be traced back to mineral deficiencies. Uh, personally, myself, you know, this is kind of, I maybe should have did a little bit of an intro with that, but, you know, where, where my interest in biohacking or nutritional optimization comes from is some early life health challenges that led me into kind of digging into the research publications. And, you know, I'm a bit of a self-professed, you know, biohacker in that, in that regard. Um, but, but the evidence that uh, minerals are absolutely paramount to the health of any organism is, uh, is quite, quite well understood. Now, the challenge with that is that we don't really understand the mineral requirements of honeybee very well. That research hasn't bore, borne itself out yet. Uh, and here's here's where the methodology that I'm employing really gets its utility, really has its, its use case, is that we can wait another 150 to 200 years uh, until the research funding goes to enough research scientists to take honeybees into a lab in isolation and one element at a time, you know, one concentration, one research publication at a time, start to tease that out uh, and, and the physiological mechanisms out one element at a time. It's going to take forever if we take that approach. Uh, this, this entire thought process or methodology was, okay, in a, in a resource-constrained environment where we need to produce results quickly, like we need more functional nutritional tools, let's just analyze the things that are in pollen and nectar. Assume that nature knows what it's doing. Uh, and that all of those things are there for a reason. And let's just mimic that uh, instead of, you know, waiting for these, you know, me mechanistic research publications to, 
you know, happen over the next couple hundred years, one element at a time. And I've taken the same approach with the trace trace element profiles. Again, historically, we know what pre-agricultural uh, soil levels were because we have humic shale uh, deposits uh, and we know that seawater, just because of the massive flooding uh, and kind of cat cataclysmic uh, events that have happened historically on the planet, seawater uh, and that mineral distribution represents very well uh, what those uh, humic shale uh, deposits represent just because the seawater has been all over the surface of the planet at one period of time or another. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to bring that trace mineral uh, element uh, content up to what it would look like pre-industrial uh, pre human activity on our soils. This is where it gets complicated. I'm going to try to be coherent when I de deliver this message, but ultimately when I'm talking about microbial metabolites, and I'm talking about bacillus subtilis, I want to make sure that I qualify what the message is. I, I, I don't, uh, in, you're familiar with this discussion about bacillus subtilis because I've been chirping in your ear for, for a number of years about this microbe. And it's been a big part of our in-house uh, R&D and, and test formulations. The, the challenge with this microbe for, for me is it's been, it was very easy to source this in the quantities that I needed to when I was doing, uh, you know, some in-house testing and, and working with, you know, guys, guys like yourself uh, to get some third-party validation. Uh, but to scale that up at a manufacturing level uh, with a grass a grass status in, in the U.S. as well as Health Canada approval on that strain of microorganism, that's been the challenge. So it was a bit of a lag uh, in time when I first made these things commercially available to the update that's just recently happened. Um, so this this microbe is available in the updated formulation. It's been a part of the in-house R&D uh, all along. Um, but again, the challenge was is to <clears throat> making sure that we had a strain of microbe and a producer uh, that had grass status uh, uh, in, in the U.S. as well as Health Canada approval. So we've checked those boxes uh, and we're kind of locked and loaded on Vaxillus subtilis. So now I'm going to talk about it a little bit. I'm going to show some research publications here over a series of slides. Um, it's a little bit, it's not an overly complicated message, but it's intricate. So I'm going to try to make this co be coherent. I guess at the end of the day, uh, 50,000 foot view, the, the message is that the honeybee has a very intricate and interesting relationship with this microbe. And that relationship has really kind of borne itself out, you know, one research publication at a time over the last uh, decade or so. And I've been staying on top of this. It's been a, it's been a, a topic of interest to mine for, for quite some time. And I think there's enough information now that it's a co it paints that uh, coherent story and, and a message. So again, that message is about a microbe uh, and honeybee and a very intricate relationship. So Bacillus subtilis is a ubiquitous environmental microbe. It's all over everything, essentially. It's in the soil. It's in the intestinal tract of most, most mammals. You take humans that live in concrete jungles, you know, in the depths of the city, you might find some, you know, exceptions to that. But any, any humans that have uh, interactions with, the, you know, the natural world are going to have this microbe uh, in their intestinal tract. And honeybees are no exception to that. Uh, this microbe's all over pollen. Uh, it's all, all through nectar samples uh, in the natural environment. And honeybees as they're conducting their, their natural foraging activities are being exposed to this microbe. They're collecting it with nectar samples and collecting it with pollen samples and they're bringing this microbe back to the hive. And through those food processing mechanisms that they have inside the hive, so nectar into honey and pollen into bee bread, there's a fermentive activity that takes place. And this microbe, as it's con consuming poly polysaccharides and disaccharides, in some cases monosaccharides, inside those two uh, food mat matrices, it it's producing metabolites that are nutritive to the honeybee. So there's a good you know, body of research on this microbe more as a, as a probiotic. It does produce some think compact, it does produce enzymes, amylases. Um, so it, it helps the honeybee in some regard, help, helps them digest your food. It does produce some antimicrobial compounds called bacteriosins. There's a good body of research on that, but that's not why we use this microbe. One of the primary metabolites or end byproducts of fermentation by this microbe is a compound called menaquinones or MK7, um, more commonly known as vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 uh, essentially acts as a very important redox molecule in uh, the honeybee mitochondrial electron transport chain. 
there's actually two two pathways that it acts as a redox molecule in um, the mitochondrial electron transport chain. It bridges a gap between complex two and complex three, making that system more efficient or helping to stabilize it under high oxidative high oxidative load situations. But it also so there's I guess there's two pathways in the honeybee that produce ATP or adenosine triphosphate. If for, for those not familiar, adenosine triphosphate is like the energy currency of a body. Uh, any multicellular organism uses uh, a mitochondrial electron transport chain to produce ATP. And the secondary pathway is called oxidative phosphorylation. Well, menaquinones, there's two, two molecules, uh, quinones and menaquinones that are absolutely of paramount importance uh, to stabilize these processes and make them efficient. Um, and it turns out the honeybee gets its uh, mitochondrial or energy production support molecules from bacterial fermentation uh, from Bacillus subtilis. So we, again, when you take, take the honeybee out of its environment and put it in a laboratory context, you start to miss some of these really key environmental interactions and, and cues that are taking place. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, uh, Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just kind of walk through some of the research publications and kind of help tell this story. But I think the first piece is to demonstrate to people that there's lots of evidence uh, in the in the peer-reviewed literature to suggest that this microbe is ubiquitous in the honeybee diet. In this first publication, uh, Bacillus in the guts of honeybees uh, mediate changes in amylase value. So again, it does it does produce uh, amylase enzymes. So in a previous study, we showed that Bacillus subtilis commonly occurs in the stomach of honeybees with uh, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens and Bacillus subtilis being the most dominant bacteria in foraging bees. I pulled these publications up because I encourage people to dig into them. There's some, some interesting, interesting stuff here. I won't read verbatim off of each, each one of these slides, but I'll leave them up long enough that people can, uh, people can get the reference if they want it. So again, here, just a couple of additional uh, publications indicating the ubiquitous presence of this microbe in the, in the honeybee diet. So of 30, 33 of 41 isolates were Bacillus subtilis in, in this first study. It was the only species associated with all pollen and bee bread samples. It's there uh, and it's pretty dominant. Okay, so there's lots of evidence suggests it's, to suggest that it's there. Um, what is the role? What is it doing? So we talked a little bit about the mitochondrial electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation pathways. Here's some research publications specifically geared to arthropods uh, and honeybees around mitochondrial dysfunction, energy utilization, uh, that, that whole story. There's lots of, lots of research publications to support what I'm claiming here. This uh, this middle publication, and this is very interesting to read. I encourage people to pull this up. <clears throat> Essentially, what they were looking at is actually a human, a human study. Uh, they were trying to look at vitamin K2 or menaquinones or, 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 or the MK spectrum and how it help, might, may help treat Parkinson's in humans. And one of the, I guess, test subjects or, or the method uh, in the research is that they were actually providing this uh, supplemental vitamin K2 uh, to flight insects. I forget the name of the exact species now. I'd have to dig back, dig back into the paper. But ultimately, what they were doing is, is, is feeding supplemental vitamin K2 or menaquinones. And they were observing that they could restore mitochondrial function in, in flight insects by providing supplemental vitamin K2. These most these two papers here. Uh, so this next slide, establishing the presence of vitamin K two or menaquinones in the honeybee diet. So these are probably the most recent publications that I'm referencing here. I think 2021 and 2019 were the publication dates on these. Um, the identification of menaquinones or vitamin K two holds as novel constituents of honey. Uh, so again, it it's very much been validated that the honeybee is bringing this microbe back through its foraging activities. Uh, and it is doing uh, the carbohydrate fractions in those two, two food sources, uh, and it's producing its uh, metabolites. And those metabolites are very critical support molecules to the energy production pathways in the, in the honeybee. 
Another one here, accumulation of solu soluble menaquinones, MK7, in honey coincides with the death of Bacillus uh, subspecies present in, in honey. So how to summarize all that? I just kind of rattled through that in, a, in probably about five minutes or so, but I'd like everybody to understand that that represents about a, a decade of picking away uh, at, the, at the research uh, as, as it becomes available. But I find that to be a fascinating story that we're, we're ending out if anybody's interested in uh, the human microbiome, so there's been this, this whole project going on for you know a couple of decades now called the Human Microbiome Project, and there's just been a, a flurry of research funding and publications uh, on the human microbiota or this fermentive base that we carry in our distal intestinal tract. And what we're finding out more and more, like I'll give you an example. There's a recent discovery in the human microbiome that there's compounds in uh, certain berries and compounds in certain berries like walnuts and berries like raspberries has this is called elagitanic acid and there are certain species of bacteria in our colon that uh, consume this elagitanic acid and as a as an end metabolic byproduct or metabolite or postbiotic it produces this thing called compound called urolithin a and that urolithin a uh stimulates or activates a, a pathway uh, called mitophagy. Uh, so our mitochondria uh, inside our cells, that our, our, our power plants inside of our cells get stimulated or rejuvenated uh, through bacterial fermentation of a random you know, molecule called elagitanic acid by certain species of bacteria. Well, and what we're finding out is that, that that's not unique to humans in our fermentive base. Um, basically, what we're finding out is that Multicellular organisms have this onboard chemical manufacturing or pharmaceutical manufacturing plant uh, in the distal intestinal tract. These, these resident and these transient microbes are consuming, are consuming, are consuming like polysaccharide fractions and certain components of the diet that the organism itself doesn't have the genes, uh, doesn't encode, doesn't have the genetic code to produce the enzymes to metabolize these components itself. So because in nature, there's no vacant niche, certain microbes will come into that uh, distal intestinal tract um, that can metabolize those things. And as a result, those metabolites, those end metabolic byproducts or postbiotics, you know, through evolution or design, uh, whatever your worldview is, uh, those metabolites, I, I just believe that there's no waste in nature. Everything that's there is there for a reason. And those metabolites, have very key physiological roles to play within that organism. Uh, that stuff, the things aren't there by random uh, or by chance. Uh, they're there by, by design. So in a way, I guess, just trying to put it together in my head, there's all these nutrients that are available, but not necessarily available to the bee. But it's, in a sense, it's the microbes that are helping convert it to an available source for the bee? Is that thinking about it the right way? Yeah, I think that's a way to frame it up. So the, the I guess the, the common vernacular around this concept right now is the idea of a prebiotic, things that feed microbes. Mm -hmm. And then there's the probiotic, the microbe itself. And then there's the metabolites of the microbe, which are being referred to commonly as postbiotics. So it's, it's a new, it's not really the, the term that you'll see thrown around in research publications, it'll be referred to as metabolites or microbial metabolites. Um, but basically the things in the honeybee diet or the things in the human diet that we don't have the genetic code to produce the enzymes to degrade, there'll be microbes uh, from the environment that will come in and fill that niche that do have the genetic code or the capability to degrade those compounds. Hmm. And as they're degrading those compounds, they'll secrete new molecules or metabolites uh, that have key physiological functions within that organism. Oh, yeah. So, so your product here, how does it classify? It is it would classify as all three. It would be pre, uh, pro, and post-biotic, right? Or am I, we, thinking, am I thinking about that, right? So we've, we've tried to, we've tried to, so the next few slides, uh, when we have a discussion about he hemocellulose and why we've added that pollen polysaccharide, um, it certainly comes into the arena of pre prebiotic. I guess I basically I just want to qualify with 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 the audience here that I don't use microbes in this formulation for a probiotic effect. 
like in the traditional sense. Okay. Um, I use this micro because it produces nutritional compounds as end metabolic byproducts that provide key redox molecules for the honeybee mitochondrial electron transport chain and then oxidative phosphorylation pathway. So your honeybee won't have a stable energy production system without the presence of this microbe and its end metabolic byproducts, menaquinones. Um, so it's not a probiotic effect that I'm chasing. I'm chasing that intricate nutritional relationship. Like what I'm, I guess what I would submit is that feeding honeybees a diet that's devoid of this microbe and its downstream metabolites, menaquinones, would be suboptimal at best. There's a relationship between the honeybee and this microbe that needs to be respected. Uh, and my view is that it's, look, the research is sound on the probiotic effect and the, these bacteriosins are, you know, quite powerful compounds, you know, helping out with that, you know, collective hive immunity, if you will. But that's not the reason that I pers pursue that microbe. It's an added benefit. It's there and it'll produce that effect. But I'm chasing this. I've I used this microbe historically, and it's in the updated formulations because of vitamin K2 or menaquinones and the electron transport chain within the honeybee cells. Holy smokes. That's... Uh, it's nutrition, I guess, is, is the basis for this. Yeah, boy. Almost um, in a sense like the honeybee is an omnivore with all the... Like it's digesting the microbes to be able to, to access especially this vitamin K here. Is, is that right? It's, it's, is it the decomposition of the microbes or is it the secretion of the microbes that's providing this nutrition? In some cases, it's the former. In some cases, it's the latter. So in the case of uh, vitamin K2 and Bacillus subtilis, so as Bacillus subtilis, it's a spore-forming organism. Uh, so it has the ability, it's a very resilient organism. They're shelf-stable. You don't have to refrigerate them. They can stay shelf-stable for up to five years. But they go into this dormant state or spore state where they have this very tough outer shell on them. So that process of sporulation, so there's a, it's, a, it's about 35 minutes uh, that uh, I guess the reproductive cycle of Bacillus subtilis, if the environmental conditions are met. So as it's in this dormant state inside the spore, it has these little nodes that are sticking out and they're nutrient, they're environmental sensors, basically. And as soon as the moisture content, the temperature and the nutrient uh, profile is right in the environment, you know, based on those sens sensory inputs, it'll start to shed, shed that outer spore or the process is called sporulation. And then it goes into its vegetative state, which is a, a doubling rate of about 35, uh, 30, 35 minutes. As soon as it hits the temperature again, the right environmental conditions, as it's going through that life cycle, as as it's dying, um, it's giving off these vitamin K two uh, home loads uh, in, into the environment because in prokaryotes or kind of bacteria, single single celled organisms, menaquinones is the driving molecule in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. But in prokaryotes, um, or sorry, in eukaryotes, multicellular organisms, it's uh, it's actually a different molecule. It's it's, it's quinone. Uh, so it's the same kind of family of compounds, but a different compound. So basically why you're getting, one of the reasons why you're getting vitamin K2 uh, in honey and bee bread samples uh, is because of the life cycle and the death of Bacillus subtilis. It's giving up these molecules into, the, in, into that matrix because basically it's spewing out as, as the microbe is, uh, is dying. Hmm. It's not the only microbe that does that, uh, okay. but it does it very well. And it's got a, a very well-documented presence uh, within, within the honeybee in kind of natural setting. Right. Oh, yeah. We felt like it was a, a no brainer to, to, you know, to leverage this information. What, what's not clearly understood. And so, so we know that these menaquinones act as a redox molecule and they act, act as a bridging molecule. So there's several enzyme complexes that make up this thing called the electron transport chain. Well, we know, e even though in honeybee cells, it's actually a, di a slightly different molecule called quinones that act as the primary electron transporter in that transport chain. We do know that menaquinones or vitamin K2 uh, can act as a bridging agent if there's a deficiency uh, between complex one, two, and three. It can actually form a, a bridge if there's a damage there uh, and reestablish efficiency. So it acts as a bridging molecule between complex two and compl complex three. So there's mechanisms there that are starting to be teased apart. But here's, if there's, if there's an aspiring bee 
researcher that ever watches this video. So one of the things that's really interesting about um, vitamin K2, there was a Canadian dentist uh, back in the day, and you may have heard of him, but his name was Weston A. Price. And he did, um, so he did an amazing thing, basically. He, you know, I don't know if research is the right word, but an investigation, an amazing, amazing investigation. He went around the world. What he wanted to know is that he started to notice physical degeneration. Uh, obviously the teeth were his kind of his primary ob observation, but as societies from around the world started to get, you know, modern roads, isolated traditional societies, as they came into context with, you know, the modern diet, he, he started to notice physical degeneration and he took it upon himself to embark on a globe trotting mission to visit all of these indigenous cultures from around the world. And he wanted to know what were, what were the nutritional elements that were missing in the modern diet that were allowing this physical degeneration to, uh, to, to occur. Well, they didn't have the analytical technology at the time to determine it. But so I think there's an interesting parallel here because in his writings, he, he talked about this missing factor X in, uh, in human nutrition as they became, came into contact with, uh, with modern diet. And, you know, in honeybees, obviously, you know, it's in common vernacular, we're pursuing this mysterious factor X in, in honey, honeybee nutrition that we can't seem to and seem to find. Now, I'm not suggesting that vitamin K2 is that missing factor X, but I just think it's an interesting, you know, parallel. Right. So later on, it was discovered that that nutrient that he couldn't define in the absence of the lab techniques to do it uh, was vitamin K2. So the question that I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I know. It, I know. It, it uncorked my dome as well. <laughs> but the question that I would like to, you know, more answers to, and I think there's a really cool vein of research here uh, for people that have the, the, the capabilities and, and the funding is to what other things from a physiological perspective is vitamin K2 doing? Uh, in the honeybee, because it has multiple roles in, in mammals. I, it's a calcium transporter uh, in humans. Uh, you know, it's a very kind of well-kept secret that, you know, if you have arterial calcification uh, in, a, in a human context, cardiovascular disease, you can dose about 300 micrograms a day of vitamin K2, and it'll reverse those arterial plaques. But that's well documented in the literature. So it, it takes calcium. It's a transport molecule. It keeps calcium out of your soft tissue and drives it into the bone structure where it needs to be. Is there a parallel mechanism inside arthropods? You know, is it uh, a part of a proper mineral utilization and disposition in the exoskeleton? There's all kinds of cool questions there to, to get answers to, but I don't know. And I'm certainly not, you know, making any claims there, but there's plenty of documentary evidence to uh, make the claims that I am here. This is all, I can, I can back up why I'm using this micro all day. Boy, talking to you is like drinking from a fire hose. My wife oh. says the same thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> I think earlier I said, you know, either brilliant or batshit crazy. And <laughs> right now I'm leaning to brilliant. <laughs> I'll Maybe. take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. You know, look, at, at, at the end of the day, you know, I don't want to present myself here. You know, Apis Biologics, that's a very scientifically blended name. I, I've had an interest in, in biological sciences since I was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper. Always been interested in, in human optimization, human physiology, that kind of thing. So I'm inclined this way, but I don't want to market myself as, as a research scientist or I'm just a guy who is very interested in science and happens to have a couple of screws loose and thinks it's fun to spend <laughs> hours every day, you know, digging through the research publications to kind of pull out these gold nuggets. So, yeah, I just want, I think that was a good qualifier to throw in there. Yeah, no, that's very good. Jump to the next slide here because there's a really interesting story here as well. Microbial metabolites from hemocellulose and bifidobacteria. Here's another really cool area where we really need a lot more research. Um, th this is going to be an exploding field. Uh, over the next decade or so. Um, hemocellulosis, our poly so you'll notice hemocellulosis on our label of bioactivator. So why? Uh, why, would I, why would I put that in there? Why do I think it's relevant? So hemocellulosis are polysaccharides in plant cell walls that have beta 1, 4 linked backbones with an equatorial configuration. That's just the 
the structure of the, the molecule itself. Hemocellulosis includes xylomannans, xylomannans, mannans, glucomannans, and beta-1314 glucans. So there's a bit of a mouthful there, but there's a bunch of them. And I would encourage people to, you know, make sure if you're going to, you know, do this on your own uh, and add these things to your, to your, to your feed to do some in-house R&D, make sure you're getting the right ones. Uh, so what we're looking to do is we're looking to mim mimic uh, the molecules the hemocellulose compounds that are contained within the inner layer of the pollen grain or the intine. So it's a very specific set of molecules out of this class of molecules. Again, I'm not going to give all of my intellectual property away here. Um, but it's important to note, again, just, just to emphasize that the correct characterization or type of hemocellulose and the respective quantities present within pollen have been respected. And if you're going to attempt to do this, uh, I would encourage you to do the same. So another complicated story. I'm going to try to make this make sense to everybody. But on that same thread about the honeybee having this onboard chemical manu or pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in its distal intestinal tract. So one of those key species. And so we talked about Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus subtilis could be classified as not so much a member of the honeybee microbiome, but a transient member of the honeybee microbiome. It's present in all of the research uh, studies when people analyze the microbial contents of honeybee guts uh, because they're getting this environmental exposure to it, but it won't take up permanent residence in, in anything. It doesn't do it in humans. It sticks around for a couple of weeks. So to get these effects, it's through continuous uh, environmental exposure uh, of the microbe. So a transient member of the honeybee microbiome, Bacillus subtilis. Bifidobacteria, on the other hand, is a part of the honeybee microbiota. This first research uh, publication, Division of Labor in the Honeybee Gut Microbiota for Plant Polysaccharide Digestion. Well, hemocellulose is one of those polysaccharides. Polysaccharide degradation genes were identified in the genome sequences of cultured bee. Actually, I won't read all of that uh, verbatim. Um, I'll just kind of jump to the next slide. But basically, I'm just trying to lay the, the research foundation for what, uh, for what we've done here. These slides are a bit text heavy. It's a little bit tough to hit the, uh, I'm not a professional presenter here. You, you may be able to tell. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bit rough around the edges, but hopefully I'm getting the message across to people that you know this, these formulations are very much data-based and they're yeah. in my, in my view, uh, they're cutting edge in a lot of ways. Like I, I'm hoping that I'm opening, opening up some discussion, um, for some more research into these emerging uh, threads. And at the end of the day, what we're looking to do is just set, a, set some new benchmarks for what a pollen supplement should look like and what a nectar supplement should look like. This was an interesting publication. Uh, Bifidobacterium is one of the dominating uh, bacterial uh, genre uh, in the honeybee gut, and they are a key degrader of dietary polysaccharides. Previous genomic analysis shows that they belong to a separate phylogenetic clusters and exhibit different uh, functional properties in hemocellulose uh, digestion. Uh, some other text highlighted down here uh, play an important role in the synthesis of metabolites, in, uh, influencing the growth and development uh, of the host. We'll get into the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, here shortly. So detangling the, the metabolic functions of bacteria in the honeybee gut. So just to read some highlighted text, moreover, a specific gut symbiont, a bac bacteria, a bifidobacterium asteroides, stimulated the production of host hormones uh, known to impact bee development. So specifically, uh, these pollen polysaccharides, hemocellulose is a part of that class of pollen uh, intine layer polysaccharides, that the host, the honeybee, doesn't encode the genes necessary to degrade those polysaccharides, uh, but Bifidobacterium asteroides has come in to fill that niche. And when the honeybee consumes pollen, the, those hemocellulose and other polysaccharide molecules are getting consumed by this microbe, and their metabolites are directly stimulating uh, host hormones that are known to impact uh, bee development. We'll talk about what those hormones are before we end the presentation. Yep. Everything that you've just been saying till now is the reason why I'm using your product. Hopefully, it, like, yeah, I, I, I don't present too well. I tend to ramble. So hopefully this is going to be coherent, man. Like, you know, it's not no, like no, it's coming across very well. You know, for the struggle, it, I mean, it, I think it especially 
showed last year where I had such hardship through the spring and I had disease issues. Like that's the underlying problem. We're always having all these disease issues and pulling down on their health. And, you know, the weather is causing a lot of that problem, all the stresses there. And I'm, I was on the verge of losing absolutely everything, but my colonies, and I didn't treat any antibiotics, my colonies were in just this epidemic of nosema, this explosion of 28 million spore counts within their gut, just on the edge. Everybody else is treating, and I didn't. I'm just focusing on the nutrition, feeding the supplements. And as soon as that weather turned a little bit, my bees turned on a dime like that. And the growth and the performance of those colonies was absolutely outstanding. I was able to make up for most of my losses through splits and such, just capitalizing on the growth. But also I had a, a record honey crop. I mean, where did that That's come awesome. from? Lots, I mean, I, I do appreciate a lot is out there and it has to be out there to bring it in. But if you yep. don't have those bees to bring it in, you don't get it, right? So you know, I'm, I'm forever converted is it's a, it's something that I think has helped just allow the bees to recoup and then move forward is it's uh, something that was an amazing sight last year. Yeah. So anyway, I'll let you get talking again. I'll, I'll stop my rambling. No. And I mean, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head there. And that was the whole intent with this, you know, it was about how do we, how do we get, the artificial feeds that we're providing to perform more like those mid those late spring conditions when you can see your bees turn around on a dime because of those nutritional profiles that are coming in from the natural environment so when beekeepers need to reproduce that effect that's that's the idea of a comprehensive nutritional program like honeybees don't need a stimulation effect like they don't they don't need a you know a boost you know per per se they're highly prolific organisms our job is to provide those raw material inputs that their physiology needs to express that resilience. Like they're, you know, it's hard to stay on top of them when they're getting all they need. Mm -hmm. It's like in, in my view that that's our job or, or my role as a, as a, as a feed formulator is to look to nature, which is in my view, there's no mistakes made there. Everything there in its proper proportions, they're there for a reason. They're there in those concentrations for a reason. And when you respect those detail right down to the minutia, that's when you really start to see some results in, in your feeding program. Mm -hmm. But that's it. It's uh, it's about resilience in, in the apiary. A good resilience. Program. Yeah, that's a good word for it, resilience. So I think I'm on the right slide here, Ian. Are you looking at presenter screen or are you looking at? Nope, I've, I've got the correct screen up here yet. We're good to go. Okay, yeah, very good. I'll try to jump back in here. That'll be the last time I interrupt you. Sounds sounds good. So just to touch on some highlighted text here, uh, this research publication, uh, the honeybee gut micro microbiota promotes host weight gain via bacterial metabolism and hormonal signaling. So what, again, what they're kind of teasing out here is uh, bifidobacterium, uh, bifidobacterium asteroides uh, in particular. Um, digest plant polymers or hemocellulose. Again, that's why we picked that, uh, that plant, poly, uh, plant pollen polysaccharide in particular for our formulations. Um, this bacteria consumes that and its end metabolic byproducts or its metabolites upregulate hormonal uh, pathways uh, in the honeybee. A couple of additional uh, publications here. There's two, four, four or five more I want to just put up on screen. So another one here, honeybees as a model uh, for gut microbiota research. It's actually a cool publication as well. So bifidobacterium asteroides stimulates the production of host-derived uh, prostaglandins, uh, prostaglandins and juvenile hormone derivatives known to impact honeybee development. That's an interesting publication. And I, I just want to stop and touch on that for a second, Ian, because th there's been a lot of research interest and a lot of inquiry and just thought process in general around better understanding that annual cycle of the honeybee colony and what are the triggers or what are those mechanistic switches that get engaged in the spring um, when, well, juvenile hormone titers, you know, start, start, start to go up. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on whether or not that's the, the act of foraging itself. You know, it's the flight activity coming back to the hive that's stimulating those, uh, you know, hormonal uh, pathways or at, acting as epigenetic, you know, uh, factors. Um, 
there's been a lot of question as to whether or not it's around daylight hours, temperature. I wouldn't say that these research publications are pointing conclusively to the fact that it's microbially based, um, but I think that they have a role to play. So we directly know, and these are recent publications. Now we directly know that the resident microbiome of the honeybee, when it's exposed to uh, plant uh, pollen polysaccharides from the intine layer of the pollen shell, hemocellulose uh, in particular, degrades those polysaccharide compounds, produces metabolites that impact physiological pathways responsible for prostaglandins uh, and juvenile hormone uh, derivatives. So there's a, there's a microbial factor here, which is environmentally driven. So I think it's another part of that story. Okay, just a minute. I'm going to take a shot of uh, bourbon, and then I need you to explain that last bit ag again, because... Uh... That sounded very interesting. It is very interesting. And I, I, I don't have any answers here, but this is a clue uh, as to some of the things that might be going on. So re, re, maybe if you could speak to me and everything you said there, what exactly did you say in a um in a dumbed would, down version <laughs> it would be helpful if i remembered what i said <laughs> <laughs> um in high level look um so there's been a lot of discussion a lot of inquiry over the years about just trying basically we're trying to better understand what is it that flips that spring switch inside yeah. a honeybee colony? What is it that generates that nest turnover, that initiation, right? So there's been writings on that being light driven, temperature driven, uh, the act of foraging itself, like the, the flight activity, the foraging itself being that epigenetic, you know, factor which all they all might be a part a part of an overall picture but what these new publications around the gut microbiota are starting to uncover is that there's mechanistic relationships between bacterial metabolites specifically bifidobacterium ascaroides and its consumption of fractions of the pollen uh protective layer those polysaccharides producing metabolites that are directly impacting hormonal titers uh within the honeybee so that springtime switch that gets flipped in the honeybee colony we're starting to tease out uh me mechanistic relationships between the gut microbiota of the honeybee and its metabolites from pollen polysaccharides wow that's, is, that's really cool yeah yeah it absolutely is um and it's, it's just not just uh impacts on hormonal titers inside the honeybee. There's a bunch of stuff here. There's a, a bunch of other reasons why I'm using pollen polysaccharides. Um, same, same kind of concept producing, uh, producing beneficial uh, end metabolic byproducts. But, but again, I, I don't want to give all of my IP away here. We'll just kind of move, <laughs> just kind of move, move to the next slide. But that is a very cool story. There's, there's lots of room for some more research there. Yeah, that is a cool story. So trying to sum up, I mean, a very, very cool story. So again, if there's a aspiring the researchers, you know, listening to this, I would encourage you to pull that thread just a little bit farther. Yeah. So a bit of a summary slide here on bioactivator. Respecting and mimicking nature in the finest of details, bioactivator is intended. Its primary intention uh, is to bring the nutritional profile of pollen supplements into alignment with that of floral pollen. And that, that's an important message here is that, you know, a package of bioactivator by itself doesn't represent, um, doesn't represent uh, a mimic of pollen. Uh, to kind of go back to some of the initial discussion, when we first started doing this work, we were formulating feed from scratch. Um, so the, the raw material inputs that artificial feed formulators are using to make their supplemental feeds. I have all of that in-house data because I've been making my own feeds for, for a number of years. So that nutritive profile or that amino acid profile, what's present, what, what's its respective concentration, what we're trying to do to make sure that these things are economically viable to use. And I, I really think we've been able to do that um, is we're, we're using that uh, base formulation that formulators are providing now. And we're using that as the backbone to get all of these profiles up to the activation thresh thresholds. 
if ever, anybody's wondering what that bioactivator name is for, that, that's kind of the basic concept is we talk about, you know, the me mechanistic target of rapamycin. We talk about the mitochondrial electron transport chain and all of these nutritional cues that come in from floral pollen act as uh, activators. They act as gene switches, but they have to hit the right concept. They have to be there first. So we're, we're adding things that nobody else is, but we're also coming over top of deficient states in key nutrients. And we're, we're bringing those up to activation uh, threshold levels. That's kind of the, the general uh, concept behind that name. <laughs> but what it represents, or I feel it represents, is the first truly full spectrum amino acid profile uh, for artificial feeds. It's the first to provide critical, neuro, the critical neurotransmitter gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. It's the first to provide trace mineral replacement or supplementation for APRAs existing within an agricultural context. So, if, you know, if you're a hobbyist or a sideline beekeeper and you live uh, in an environment where there's lots of natural wild forage and it's not in an agricultural area, you know, that uh, the significance of that trace mineral replacement would be diminished in that, that, that context, right? But that's not most beekeeping. Most beekeeping is, you know, in heavily agricultural, you know, in, environments, right? The first to bring you the leading edge science of microbially produced uh, menaquinones, Bacillus attilus and NK7, and by extension, nutritional support for the honeybee mitochondria uh, and oxidative phosphorylation pathways following nature's intricate design. I think that is such a cool story there about the relationship of the honeybee and, and that microbe. And then finally, uh, the first to bring you the leading edge science of bifidobacterium produced metabolites or postbiotics through dietary application of our proprietary whole plant, a bioactive profile. And we're, we're just getting warmed up on, on that, uh, that front as well. Ultimately, again, taking a very conservative approach to marketing. Uh, we're making no claims with this stuff, uh, but I do encourage beekeepers to give this a try because uh, we do believe that we are establishing a new benchmark in supplemental pollen nutrition. Yeah. All right. That is, that is really good. I, I really appreciate uh all the, the collaboration that we've done over the last bunch of years, you know, the way I look at it as a beekeeper, a lot of it is dictated on the natural world out there, but I was finding that deficit, especially like you just mentioned there within the agricultural uh, community. And, and I'm trying to find a way that I can balance my honey farm activities with the activities of the grain farm and the grain farm wins out all the time. So, you know, we're taking down tree rows and we're spraying the crops and we're just leaving the the landscape <clears throat> in a deficit of diversity. So I've just always felt that our hives, if anything, are malnourished. And if we can do anything as beekeepers is to try to fill in those blanks the best we can. I, I'm not foolish enough to think that we can, um, replace pollen itself and that natural aspect coming in but more a sense maybe exactly. trying to complement it right or supplement it and to help fill in those building blocks so i looked at it right off the mark with you okay you know bare bones <laughs> basics fill in those bulk nutrients during the times which we think they're in deficit so we did that and then we just kept building on top of that okay now let's bring another layer to this and another layer to this and another layer. So now we have this nutritional package that we are actually able to focus on the situation at hand. Like I'm not, not going to be feeding this all the time because I mean, the natural world surely to goodness would will, will produce when it does produce, but we're just, I'm just trying to focus in on those times when it's not and just being able to have the tools at my disposal to help them do that. And I think it's becoming very effective because we're seeing results within our hives and just our little mini trials, right? Where, where we're seeing a response, direct response to providing the, those nutritional profiles that they need at those certain times um, during very stressful times. And I think that helps combat with diseases and all everything else too. So I'm quite excited. This is uh, really cool. I, I appreciate you putting this together. Um, it's hard to, you know, a guy like me is hard to absorb all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's super interesting. It's hard to, to, to it. it I, I can appreciate that. It's tough for me to communicate. Um, it, it's easy for me to sit here, you know, by myself, you know, kind of dig through the research publications and, you know, the practical, you know, pieces and parts, but communicating it out to everybody is the, uh, the challenging part in a, in a coherent way, because I'm not a, 
you know, presenter per se, like I don't really do a lot of YouTube, you know, stuff, but, but I did feel like this message was important because it was okay to be silent and absent from, you know, public discussion when this was an in-house project. Uh, but through, you know, a lot of inquiry, people asking about what we've been up to and that kind of thing. I did make the decision last spring to make this commercially available. And now that people are, you know, buying this from me, I, I owe it to that audience to explain, you know, what this work is and, and what, what I think it represents. Right? Yeah, I very much appreciate that. And uh, I hope you don't mind. I, I always refer to you as a crazy New Brunswick beekeeper, but <laughs> you'll be throwing think, axes at me I... next, next time you see me. You'll be like, Ian, stop it. <laughs> I think that's actually pretty fitting. I don't mind that at all. <laughs> well, listen to some of the stuff that you've been uh, describing here. It's it's hard to keep up and I can definitely, uh, uh, you know, there is no crazy about this. This is absolute science this is the science behind all of this so that's that's fundamentally you know what i the message that i wanted why i thought it was important to you know make a, an official communication on this is because i wanted people to understand that you know it's not just some random you know throwing some amino acids and minerals you know into into a bag you know and telling you that it's going to be good for your beast like like this has been a decade of work and to your point you know one layer at a time kind of adding those layers of complexity to it and there's an important message in there. Um, there's, you know, there's a good chance that this video, you know, because of the size of your platform, will have you know a pretty wide, wide reach. And you know, there's, and again, it is a double-edged sword when you're talking about the complexities of your formula. Because what I would encourage beekeepers to do, if you're if you're going to try to duplicate some of this work yourself, understand that by adding proline in your artificial feeds in and of itself is not enough to really move the needle. Um, by adding trace elements uh, into your feed in, in isolation by themselves, it's not really enough to meaningfully move the needle. By adding a microbe uh, and its menaquinone metabolites into your artificial feeds in and of itself in isolation, not enough to meaningfully move the needle. Uh, you really summarize that well, Ian. It's after you're bringing in those layer after layer of complexity when you start to Pollen doesn't provide these these uh, these profiles in isolation of one another. It's it's a, it's a total package of complexity, and it's only when you start to mimic that you know complex total package that you start to see some real meaningful results. So it, it, it's there was the addition of those layers stop becoming additive, and it becomes a situation of one plus one equals three at at some point, right? So. If people start to try to sell you feeds that are formulated with proline and formulated with honeybee prebiotics, like I can see that now, like it, that's coming, right? Um, but just take that with a grain of salt and understand that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, I appreciate that messaging around that too, because everything is very interactive. Everything is complementary, you know, everything kind of works in cohesion of everything. So everything in balance uh works within balance that's the way i look at things too yeah nature is the chief research scientist and, and i guess that's a that's probably a good closing message for me is that our our primary objective here was to mimic nature as precisely as possible understanding that 100 you know 150 years of laboratory isolated experiments you know one compound at a time really wasn't getting us to where i needed we needed to be um, it's about a shift in methodology. Let's look at the natural design. Let's analyze pollen. We have the analytical capabilities. Um, it just takes quite a while to build that database. But in my view, I would encourage anybody who's going to try to do this. I'm hoping what we can do, if nothing else, whether or not we have longevity uh, as a company in this space, you know, the, the free market will, will dictate that. Um, but what I'd like to be remembered for is the guy who proposed a methodology that has allowed honeybee nutrition to take up the next leap, right? It, it's, it's about using the analytical capabilities that we have to define what's in pollen and nectar, uh, and then to mimic those profiles. The, the, the historical process of studying bees in cages and in cups and laboratories and feeding them an element and, you know, looking for lifespan and it doesn't, no, just we, we need to stop doing that. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, on that note, I got to run to my next meeting, but I appreciate you hopping on with me here and appreciate all the patience. And I'm going to put this together and I'll put it up on YouTube. Very good discussion, Ian. Thanks for having me on. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Have a good night. Okay, take care.